Avatar, The Way of Water is out in theaters 13 years after it was first announced that the original Avatar would have sequels. Uh, delayed so much mostly because of the fact that James Cameron intended to make a film that would take place mostly underwater and have motion capture characters in it, which was simply impossible to do back in 20, 2009. So he, what he had to do was actually develop entirely new technology, a new type of camera, and a new way of setting up the lighting, the cameras, and the motion capture stuff, all, all of that stuff in a tank to shoot it underwater, before he could even endeavor to, to, you know, to even begin making the movie itself. And even then I've read that you know, the, the crew realized that if the actors or the crew shooting the movie had oxygen bottles on them, even if those bottles were removed visually in post-production, the fact was that there would still be air bubbles in the water and that would fuck up the photography. So what they had to do was have all the cast and crew undergo serious physical training to learn to free dive and hold their breaths for a long time, which they did end up doing. And, you know, Kate Winslet apparently holds the record amongst the cast. She held her breath one time for uh, underwater for 6 minutes 50 seconds, which is insane. So once you realize that, you know, what you're seeing in the film is a result of all those people essentially making a movie while free diving, I mean, it's, it is damn impressive, whatever else you may think about, about the movie itself. Now, the film continues the story of the original Avatar, which I also want to talk about for a little bit, because to me, it's just such a fascinating piece of cinema history. But you see, <clears throat> back in when it was coming out in 2009, I distinctly remember it was a cultural event. Everyone knew it was coming out. Everyone knew what it was. Everyone wanted to go and see it in 3D. Uh, the cinemas were packed. A lot of them here in Poland, including my local one, specifically upgraded their projectors to be able to, to project 3D for Avatar. And you know, then the film came out. Everybody went to see it. Some even a couple of times. It was visually amazing and a breakthrough in terms of the 3D technology. It made more money than any other film in history. And then it just disappeared off the face of the earth. I mean, this is the really interesting part about this for me. The fact that the biggest movie ever had zero cultural relevance once it was out of theaters. It had absolutely no legacy. I mean, think about other movies of this caliber. If I tell you, okay, imagine a scene from Titanic or name two actors from Titanic, you can do it, no problem. If I ask you to name three characters from Avengers Endgame or describe their superpowers, you can do it, no problem. If I ask you to hum a piece of music from Star Wars, anyone can do it, no problem. But try doing any of those exercises with Avatar and I'm certain you, you won't be able to do that. It's not a movie that had l any lasting cultural impact. It came and went. There is no fandom that would continue to create art and cosplay as the characters. There isn't anyone going back to view the film again and rediscover new things. There's nothing like that. Even the lead actor seems to have disappeared into obscurity after the film was done, never really appearing in anything else of importance. I mean, the reason is sort of obvious to me, if you, think, if you think about it, it's that outside of the visuals, the film was pretty unremarkable. The story was a rehash of Pocahontas, the characters were simply drawn, there weren't any iconic moments in it, the music was okay but not special. So now I think it's up to the sequels to attempt to change that, and I say sequels because Cameron shot Avatar 2 and 3 already back to back, uh, and he's now working on post-production for Avatar 3, and depending on their success, he then plans to make 4 and 5 also back to back. So, <clears throat> you know, we'll see. Maybe the fact that now it's an ongoing franchise will make it more relevant, we'll just have to wait. Anyway, on to the film itself, finally. Uh, directed once again by James Cameron, stars Sam Worthington, Zoe Saldana, uh, Sigourney Weaver, Stephen Lang, Kate Winslet. Story picks up 13 years after the previous movie ended, Humans were successfully repelled from Pandora. Jake's, Jake lives happily uh, with Neytiri and his four children and uh, leads the Navi. Uh, however, now, after this time, the humans are back. And this time, they don't just want the unobtainium, which I still think is such a ridiculous name for a mineral. They want to completely colonize Pandora because the Earth is dying. So they set up a base, but they're under constant attacks by uh, the guerrilla Navi forces. Unable to take them head on, they try a different approach. They create a clone of the evil colonel, colonel from the first movie uh, with his memories, but in the body of an avatar. 
along with several others, other soldiers, same thing, and they sent this squad of human avatars to, to go into the forest, find Jake and kill him, thus removing the leader of the insurgency and hopefully crippling it. And eventually this forces Jake to leave the forests with his family and seek out the water tribe who may or may not offer him shelter. <clears throat> That's as much as I'm saying. In general, there's quite a lot of stuff going on in the film. I mean, it runs for over three hours and some of it is really good, uh, some of it is pretty mediocre. Uh, I think that the main storyline, unfortunately, is kind of weak. I mean, a large part of Jake's development in the first film uh, was to stop running away and fight for the forest tribe. In fact, they had to, if you remember, I didn't, but I rewatched the film a couple of weeks back when it was running again in the theaters. They had to defend this magical tree uh, stuff. and. So, so it was important that, that they keep the land, that they fight there. Uh, but now he just runs away again and has to relearn that lesson all over again, only to give the story a reason to move into the water now. Uh, I thought that, you know, that's, that's kind of strange. Also, the motivation for the villains to hunt down Jake, as explained in the film, I mean, for the colonel, obviously, it's a bit personal as well, but in general, the motivation and the orders they have is to remove the leader of the insurgency, right? So when Jake realizes he's being hunted, he specifically passes the mantle of the leader to another Navi and then he leaves. So that then begs the question, does the insurgency stop resisting then? Because if yes, then there's nothing to fight for, then there's no reason to chase after Jake again. And if they don't, if they continue to fight, then obviously, since Jake is out of it, the evil guys should now chase the new leader, right? <laughs> but, of course, they continue on after Jake, so it doesn't entirely make sense. Um, I also thought that uh, there's a bit too many subplots in general, uh, and not all of them work very well. Uh, I did like the two subplots related to the space whales. I thought that those were easily the best parts of the film. I really enjoyed them. Uh, I kind of liked the Sigourney Weaver's character stuff and her powers and so on, although I feel that wasn't really paid off yet. Uh, I expect it's going to be explored more in the next movies. I liked the family dynamics of the Sullys and the dynamics between them and the Water Tribe. Uh, you know, this bit of cautiousness and apprehensiveness mixed with a level of respect, which makes sense within the story. I didn't like the stuff between the villain and the little kid named Spider. Uh, I thought that was there was a potential to do something interesting there, but ultimately it doesn't really go anywhere except becoming a plot device in the final act. And also, <clears throat> I really thought the film would do something cool with the villain, where in the first film he, you know, he totally hates the Navi, and now suddenly he wakes up in the body of one. And I thought, okay, well this, this will lead to some interesting exploration, right? Maybe he'll have to confront his xenophobic beliefs and have to realize some truths. And maybe he doesn't in the end, maybe he stays evil, but at least playing with the idea seemed fascinating. But then there's absolutely nothing done with that. He just accepts that straight away and continues to be his own asshole self for the remainder of the film. So I thought that was, that was a bit of a wasted opportunity. Um, I did think the visuals were beautiful. I mean, there's, there's no question, it's a very pretty film, uh, especially the underwater scenes. It truly is a breakthrough in terms of the technology and making this many CG characters look this good in these conditions, it's just nothing short of amazing. I mean, it is, it is photorealistic. And I thought about other examples of splendidly done CG characters in films and, you know, what comes to mind, Gollum in Lord of the Rings, uh, Thanos in, in, um, in Avengers movies. But you have to remember, though, this, this was always the case of one single character. This movie is full of them and all of them are done with that same top-notch quality. So it's, it's a bit different than throwing your resources onto one CG character versus doing a whole a whole movie this way, essentially. It is, it is impressive, there's no question about it. Um, I also want to say that uh, James Cameron clearly knows how to do two things. One, he knows how to shoot action, of which there is plenty, and it is exciting, well shot, and entertaining. And he knows how to evoke the sense of uh, wonder with the ocean environment, with the ocean stuff. In the slow scenes where not much happens and it's just characters learning about this new, new world. It really is evident how he himself is very passionate about oceans and undersea life. However, as good as those things are individually, 
I think that there is a bit of a pacing and tonal mismatch when he puts them together. Uh, what I mean is the film very clearly has Act 1, action, 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 and Act 3, action, action, action. But in between them there's Act 2, which for a while slows down almost to a halt. In fact, the main villain and the main plot disappears from the movie for like half an hour or something, and we just spend time with the Sullys and learn about the oceans, the creatures and the swimming and so on. And you know, it, those scenes are good, but it's just, it just seems a little bit off. I think it breaks the pacing and it made the movie feel very long for me, even though the action itself is paced perfectly well. And uh, the ending itself was perhaps a bit weak to me because it, it, it does feel like a middle chapter. The main plot is not really resolved. There's a feeling of, okay, well, now we get to the good stuff, which of course I expect will be paid off in the next movie, but for now left me, you know, just not fully satisfied. Overall, I'd say the second Avatar is very similar to the first. Incredible visuals, stunning use of mocap technology, some entertaining action, but other than that, a fairly unremarkable film. Decent weekend entertainment, yes, but going back to the subject of cultural relevance, I don't think The Way of Water will be much different in this regard than its predecessor.